Just gonna do a quick audio check. Check one, two, check one, two, three.
Alrighty, it's two o'clock, uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Hopefully you all are here for what you see on the screen. Uh, this is the preliminary design review of uh, BSLI's Spaceport America Cup team project. Uh, so hello, my name is Casey Ruckman. I'm the project manager uh, of the 30K team this year. So the first uh, thing is, what, what is the purpose of the Spaceport team? What do we do on BSLI? Uh, so we compete in the aptly named Spaceport America Cup. It's hosted in central New Mexico by the Experimental Sounding Rock Tree Association. Uh, it happens on June 21st through the 25th of this coming year, so during the summer. Uh, so our team's goal is to develop and present BSLI's most refined rocket, so the most technologically advanced product that we can produce and fly it at Ezra. So, the, of course, the other goal is to network within, you know, the coll collegiate community and introduce ourselves to other teams and network. That way we can have opportunities outside of college and continue to grow. So, how does our project specifically achieve these? So, within the Spaceport America Cup, we compete in the 30K SRAD competition. So, that means we fly to 30,000 feet and our rocket is student research and developed. So, we design and build almost every aspect of this rocket. So with doing that, we have to conform to Ezra's rules, which is about 80 pages worth of rules. Uh, so there's quite a bit there, uh, making sure we're following all those things and then scoring appropriately to try to win that first place uh, prize within our category and for the entire competition. And of course, we're going to have fun doing it while being safe. So obviously, we're all still wearing masks, um, but also being safe within rocketry. You know, we're dealing with you know, low power explosives and whatnot, so making sure we're safe, but also having fun doing it. Next, I'm going to hand it over to my deputy project manager. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, like you said, I am Zach Parker. Uh, I am the deputy project manager for the Spaceport America Cup team this year. So the kind of trajectory of our rocket this year, uh, last year's in-person competition was canceled. Um, that transitioned to an online competition. And with that, we still had two successful flights last year, one to about 7,500 feet and the other to about 12,500 feet. And we actually got runner-up in that uh, online competition last year. So this year, we are restarting our normal operations with 100% new parts. We're not like leaning on anything from the previous years like we have done last year. And we want to keep our focus on a simplified integration. We think that really helped us a lot last year. And it kind of led to those two successful flights. And as always, we want to advance the capabilities of our current sub-teams and kind of improve our methods and techniques. So the way, the way our team is broken down, uh, we have our project manager, Casey, myself, the deputy project manager, and then we have five subteams, the structure subteam, the payload subteam, propulsion, avionics, and aerodicovery, which is split up, or which is a combination of recovery and aerodynamics. So the way this PDR is going to work, uh, each subteam will present, present their subteam purpose, the objectives of their subteam, the process for their design, uh, risks and mitigation methods for their team, as well as their schedule. And I believe Casey is going to be going around now, uh, handing you all review item dispositions um, to kind of give us some feedback on our presentation. And we will collect those all at the end. All right, so now we are going to start with structures. How's it going, everybody? Can you hear me? Is the mic? Good. Okay, cool. So my name is Andy Ostovitz. Um, I'm a second year aerospace engineering student here, and I am the structure sub-team lead this year. So for um, structures this year has three main purposes. Um, we definitely want to start with our preliminary testing. We're going to be testing the composite um, torque specs of carbon fiber and epoxy, and then we're going to move on to fabricating the body of the rocket we obviously want to make it strong enough to survive a full flight to 30,000 feet. And then our final thing is we're going to oversee integration and housing of all the other subteams within this body of the rocket. So to complete these, we have certain objectives. Um, we're starting off with completing this preliminary testing. This is really just to have empirical evidence to back up why we use however many layers for each of our components and also for, to keep in mind when we're doing our layups for how much we can actually stretch our carbon fiber. Uh, in addition, we are also focusing on maximizing the strength to weight ratio of the structural components. So we want to have strong components that will be able to make it for the full flight. To do these things, we need to stay on track with our Gantt chart and we need to meet our deadlines. We have a lot of parts we need to make this year. We're rebuilding the whole rocket. So we have to make sure that we're staying on track and using our time wisely. And then finally, as team lead, I want to make sure that I'm educating the new members 
on the engineering process within rocketry. So it's very cool to come and make the parts and whatnot, but it's also very important to know that we're, very, we're multiple sub-teams coming together to build one final product. So this is my longest slide, so I'm going to apologize in advance. But um, to get us started, I just want to say in our SOLIDWORKS model, you can see that we run what we call a transitioning rocket. So we start from a larger diameter and end up at a smaller diameter. This is done with a transition, which is made up of two different components. So we have our coupler, which is the actual um, transition where it disperses the forces from one diameter to another. And then we have our transition piece, which is the aerodynamic shroud for the aerodynamic side of things. Um, we are making a change to our transition as opposed to how it was last year. Last year we had our transition at the top, it had a 90 degree angle and it attached to the coupler um, through the bottom by screwing in. This year we're having our transition have an overlap over top and that's just one thing that we're uh, changing moving forward. So um, finally about the transition, it's made of fiberglass and this is because it houses the antennas from the integrated systems bay for avionics. Fiberglass allows the frequencies for avionics to pass through, whereas carbon fiber would interfere with it. Um, and that's why it's made that way. The coupler, we're going to have that milled out of aluminum. Moving forward, the nose cone, body tube, motor tube, and fins will all be made out of carbon fiber for the test launch. Later on for the competition, our motor tube and fins will be made of aluminum as well. These will be made um, out of carbon fiber, as I said. And basically, going from the top down, as I said, the Structures, we build the body of the rocket and we house all the other subsystems. So our nose cone, that's where we hold recovery, the parachute and whatnot. The body tube has the integrated systems bay, the ISB, and that holds payload and avionics. And as I said, the transition, the coupler, that's for transitioning the rocket and also holding the antennas. And then the motor tube holds propulsion. So moving on to our design process, specifically for our torque testing. We will be, we started in September by making some carbon fiber test pieces, both flat pieces and also cylindrical ones. We made these out of two, four, six, eight, and 10 layers of carbon fiber, four of each of them, resulting in 20 test pieces for flat pieces and 20 test pieces for cylindrical as well. Moving forward, we're going to be drilling holes in these pieces and making a little test stand where we can also drill a hole there. We'll thread a bolt through and then a nut on the other side and we'll crank down on it with a digital torque wrench and measure how much it takes for these pieces to fail. So that failure can be anything from splitting, shearing, cracking, the layers separating. We're really just looking how much force it's gonna take to make that composite fail. And then we're gonna use this data to back our decision on how many layers we will be using and also um, to keep in mind while we're stretching the carbon fiber for layups. As for the structural components, we're going to follow the general guidelines from years prior. Um, in rocketry, there are kind of similar aspects that you use year to year, and we're going to follow those. But at the same time, we will be doing some things differently. So this year, we're going to start by making some new molds. That's for our nose cone and our transition. Our transition specifically, as I noted, we're doing that fold differently. That's one way that we're going to be changing things. But we'll also have to change the, the milling and the molds based on the information from the research done by aerodynamics. You'll hear more from that in a little bit but we will be changing those things based on their research. Other than changing those molds, we'll be following carbon fiber epoxy composite layups, obviously um, fiberglass, as I mentioned, for the transition. And these, the basic outline for these is we'll be either wrapping or layering these carbon fiber and epoxy um, composites on top of a mold and then form fitting it as best we can and either using a pressure, um, like a vacuum bag and pressuring it down to suck up some of that epoxy and form fit as best we can, or if it's on a mandrel for the tubes, we'll wrap it in shrink wrap and heat it so that we could take some of that out and form fit as best we can. So as I said, we're doing a lot of things the same as we have in the past, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna think of ways we could change. As we go on, we're continuously gonna be asking, could we do this better? Is there a better way to do this? Could we change this method? And as we go along, we're gonna make sure that we're testing applications of these new methods and ideas. So we're not scared to um, look into better ways to do things. Finally, we want to make sure that we integrate all of these parts so they fit together flawlessly. Not only do they need to be quality, but they need to go together well. Moving on, we have a couple risks to our project success. So the biggest risk to our project success is definitely time. To mitigate this, we plan to practice good time management skills, and we have to stay on top of our deadlines. We have a lot of pieces to make, more than I made last year, my first year on the team. We're making the nose cone this year, whereas last year we used an old one. So 
we have to make sure we stay on top of things, stay on top of our deadlines to keep on track with meeting our deadlines for um, having these pieces done. Moving forward, we have fabrication errors. This is basically if we made the pieces and they weren't good enough quality. Ways we're going to mitigate this is we're going to ensure the quality of each of these pieces. We're going to check them over, test them, make sure they'll work well. And then I'm also going to rely on my team members to maximize the quality of their work. Finally, we have poor integration. So if we made all good quality parts, but they don't fit together properly or they don't work well together, then that's going to be an issue as well. So, I don't know how that happened. It went back like four slides. But anyway, um, our plan for the year moving forward. So in November, we're going to be finalizing this preliminary testing. We're about halfway through there right now. We've created the test pieces, but we have yet to actually complete the testing. So we'll finalize that in this next month, and then we'll begin fabricating our parts for the test launch. Um, and once we come back from winter break, we're going to continue fabricating, fabricating these test parts and work, work on that all the way up until March, with, which is our test launch. So then we'll integrate for our test launch. We'll launch and we will um, have that data to look at in April to analyze, evaluate our test results, and make the necessary corrections so that we can make our rocket better. So say we have an issue where we want to add more filler to the nose cone or something, then we'll be able to make that, make those corrections for the competition, comp competition integration. And then at that time, that'll also be when we start getting the pieces for the competition. Like how I said, for the test, we're going to have a carbon fiber motor tube. We'll start getting our metal motor tube and fins as well. That'll carry us all the way to June, which is when we'll have our competition. So now I can open the floor to any questions you guys might have specifically for the structure sub team. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Do you have an X winder or do you do it by hand? So the question was do we have an X winder or do we behind? So we do it by hand. We um, basically we have a metal tube and we take our composite. Uh, we take our material, so our carbon fiber, we lay it on there, and then we will wrap it around the tube and we will um, spread epoxy into it as we go so we don't use a winder. Yeah, so last year what we did was we had a composite for the motor tube and we kept that for our exhibition launch. I know years in the past we've used an aluminum motor tube because it's more reliable and also we have to hit 30,000 feet. I think our exhibition launch we were only going to like 18 last year is what we hit or something like that. So we have to go double that. So the, the aluminum motor tube and fins help us to go higher. Um, but for just the test launch, we're not actually shooting up to 30,000 feet. So we just use a car carbon fiber one for that. And I'll, I'll add in here real quick. Um, the reason, the other motivation for that is we can't fly a motor of the size we fly at Spaceport here in Ohio. Uh, we don't have the airspace to go that high, so we have to downscale. But in order to downscale while maintaining the aerodynamic characteristics of the vehicle, we have to make that motor adaption. Thank you. piece is not being square. So I know that specifically for the coupler, we're making sure that we mill it this year so it's not, so we won't have any sort of um, angle when it's standing. But um, I know for that, we're milling it as one part. We're not welding it together. Um, and then as for the, the other tubes and such, they'll, they'll be, oh, sorry. Um, we're still going to build those the same way. And then having the coupler built that way, we're hoping that um, that would have that square as well. True. We're planning. We're planning. Yeah, of course. And I guess that would be part of also how we're planning to try and integrate as we go. So um, looking at what you've said, as we go along, we'll make sure that our parts are square when we put them together and not just noticing that um, at the end. But that's definitely something I'll look, I'll look into going forward. That's a good
<laughs> gotcha. The nose cone? Okay. So keep that in mind. Yeah, we yeah we have yet to start any of the parts of the rocket, and yeah, and that's part of the reason why when we start it, we definitely have to make sure we're staying on track once we do. Begin first week of January. Of course. Try to mitigate that as best possible, yeah. Especially stuff like storage cones. Because you got a whole group that's never done it. True, and lo looking at that, like how he said, we'll be talking with Carly. I'll definitely, I think I'll definitely want to talk with Carly myself too, because um, I mean, I worked under her last year. She has a lot of information for me that would be helpful, specifically with the nose cone as well, because I mean, they've seen the nose cone. I, I wasn't even, I just came, the nose cone was already built and stuff too. So, um, yeah, 100%. That's part of like this year. I mean, I'm I'm planning a lot of things, but there's some things that I'm learning as I go as uh, as well. Just assume they're going to screw up. The nose cone? Okay. So, if you wait till March to build the first one? Oh, yeah, no. That would be <laughs> that's your mouth. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, is that all for questions for structure sub team? All right, cool. Um, then I will hand it over to Aerodynamics. All right, hello everyone. My name is Steven Morosky. I am a third year aerospace major here at Ohio State, and I am the aerodynamics sub team lead. All right, so what is our purpose of our sub-team? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. We're here to predict, accurately predict the drag and stability of our rocket throughout the whole flight. Uh, but we also want to educate our members on fluid dynamics and how CFD is used to do that. And at a lot of universities, you don't end up using CFD in your undergraduate career. So this is a really unique opportunity to, to get to know a software. All right, so what are our objectives for this year? Our first one, like I said before, get drag estimates for all speed regimes, not just max Q. We also want to recommend geometry changes. As Andy said, we're going to be looking at the transition piece this year quite heavily. We also want to assess the stability throughout all phases of flight and make sure that we're not too overstable or understable at certain points. We want to gain confidence on our simulations, so we want to make sure what we're putting into the computer and getting out makes sense and isn't just a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> and then we also want to improve our ability to understand our results deeper than just like looking at pictures and drag numbers. So our general design process, we always start the year educating new members on how to use the software as it's quite complex and difficult to get a handle of. And then we start with our 2D axiosymmetric simulations where we get our initial conditions from an open rocket simulation provided by our project manager. And then we move into to more 2D axiosymmetric simulations of not just Max-Q, but all of flight, so subsonic, transonic, and supersonic. And then the spring will move into 3D simulations, and that's where we'll, we'll really get into the stability part of this. And then for all of our design changes, we want to make sure that we look up liter rel um, relevant literature on these designs to make sure that we're not just throwing designs out there. All right, so for our initial drag estimate this year, uh, Open Rocket predicted our max Q to be at Mach 1.7 and at an altitude with a pressure of 71,000 pascals. So this is our initial drag estimate. So you see that's about a 700 newtons of drag at this condition. And the, uh, the motor tube is the largest contributor as we would expect due to pressure drag. Uh, but it should be noted here that we're not actually simulating the motor exhaust. 
and that during max Q, there would be some motor exhaust, which might eliminate some of this pressure drag. Um, the coefficient of drag we got is 0.26, and that is using the six inch body tube diameter as a reference area. And that is also pretty close to the open rocket coefficient of drag. And here we're also not using, we're not simulating the fins just due to that nature of axisymmetric simulations. You would rotate the fin around and it would just be a big block at the back of your rocket, so it wouldn't make any sense. So being about 100 newtons under seems about right. All right, so like I said, we're starting to look into the transition piece. So for these initial simulations, we're running it at the same max Q as that simulation I just showed you. Uh, and we have three different designs. So we first have our conical, which is our current design. And it's just a straight line when you take the cross section with a trailing edge fillet. Then we have a convex design where it is tangent to the body tube and then comes and just hits the motor tube. And then we have a concave design where it's tangent to the motor tube. So these are our pretty contours and drag numbers for these initial simulations. So as can be seen here, at this max Q condition, it seems that our conical current design is the best, but convex is really not too much worse. Uh, and then concave is obviously by far the worst, adding 40 Newtons. The other thing I did is that it's really hard to tell what's going on because in these uh, contours, because, oops, sorry, because <laughs> the max scale here is the pressure at the nose cone. So I went ahead and I adjusted these contours so you can really see what's going on in this transition region. And, and these pictures, the max and minimum pressures are all within this picture. So we can use these to try to help understand exactly what's going on and potentially change our designs based on these pressure contours. All right, so what does this mean for us going forward? Like I said, convex is not too much worse and it may even be better than um, conical uh, at lower speeds just due to the fact that the concave doesn't have that curve on it right now or sorry, the um, conical doesn't have the curve on it right now, so it might lead to separation earlier. Uh, we're probably gonna get rid of looking at the concave, uh, which is the inner one, just because it's so much worse. And then possibly, uh, if we're gonna look into the convex design, maybe adding a trailing edge fillet. So if I go back here, maybe instead of this just hitting at the bottom, just trying to flatten it out a little bit, which might get rid of some of this, uh, maybe try to move that shock back a little bit. Um, other things, when I was looking up things in literature, maybe possibly just changing the angle and length of our conical transition piece will affect the drag more than changing the curve. All right, so for projects, uh, risk to project success, we really have two main ones. So over an underestimation of drag. If we overestimate drag, then we can force structures to make a heavier rocket than we need, which might make us hit a lower apogee. Um, or if we underestimate drag, structures will underbuild it and then it'll break apart in flight. Uh, incorrect estimation of stability is our other possible error. So if we think the rocket's gonna be overstable, but it's really understable, then it's gonna go wild in flight and not go where we want it to. Or if we think it's gonna be understable and it ends up being too stable, it'll weather cock into the wind and we won't end up going as high. So mitigations, we definitely wanna get more into 3D sims this year to actually get those stability estimates. But we also wanna make sure that we verify our computational methods and are confident in what's coming out of our simulations. And can we, do, we can do this through things such as mesh refinement studies and also comparing to experimental results. We also wanna test out a bunch of different flight speeds. As I said in the past, we've only really tested at max Q before. And then we can also use hand calculations to help get a better grasp of what's going on. So the plan for this year, in the fall, we'll look into the transition piece Sims with motor exhaust and fin flutter. The bottom two things are really just extra projects if we get to them. Uh, and then in the spring, we're gonna look into doing full 3D sims and getting our stability versus Mach number and angle of attack, and then our full drag estimates, continuing fin flutter analysis, and then some more hand calculations. But overall goals for this year, uh, it'd be nice to do, like I said, mesh, mesh independence and refinement studies to help us understand our simulations better also gaining access to the Ohio supercomputing network. That way we can run our 3D sims faster and get more results, and then potentially some wind tunnel testing. So that's all I have. Any questions? 
That's a good question. I think we're thinking about trying to get into the arc if that's possible, but we're still trying to work on making those connections to do that. Yep. Okay, no more than 10 degrees. Okay, thank you. Could you write that down? Thank you, <laughs> just so I remember it. Uh, there's also a question in the chat. Uh, is the high motor tube drag actually base drag? Yeah, so yeah, the question in the chat was, is the high motor tube drag base drag? And I believe it is. It should be base drag. Did you say, how are we gonna simulate it? Um, so in Fluent, you should be able to add another uh, pressure outlet. So we have two, two things we're thinking of right now. Either our, uh, Casey has said that our motor should be ideally expanded at the end of the nozzle. So we'll put that pressure outlet as just atmospheric pressure. Or we might try to get chamber conditions at different points, points in flight and try to simulate um, the nozzle itself coming from chamber pressure and then to the outlet. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. About how, like how you're saying the percentage of base drag compared to like the um, motor exhaust. Right, yeah, so I think with this motor tube, uh, this slide, uh, this is a combination of both the skin friction and pressure drag generated, like the base drag generated by it, uh, but I had not yet separated it out to see how much of that drag from the motor tube is base drag. Yeah, I think it's a lot, isn't it? Like the majority is. Right. Yes, that's what we'd expect to happen. Like, is that the, um, yes. Right. Right, so the other thing we need to look at is that this is max Q, so there should be motor exhaust, but if we move forward a little bit in time, then we really get to understand the base drag better. Right. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. Right, right. Oh, I see, like, instead of trying to simulate the motor exhaust, you just subtract the base drag out, is what you're saying? Yeah, calculating the base drag. Okay, right. We've also got another question in the chat uh, regarding the same thing. Uh, can you mitigate the base drag by having a smoke filler? Uh, so the question in the chat was, can we mitigate the drag using a smoke trailer? Um, I'm not entirely sure what a smoke trailer is. I've never heard of that before, so I guess we can look into that. Oh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, so the, the, I guess the answer to that would be we want more propellant, so there's, we don't really want to add a smoke grain at the bottom to reduce the drag.
Okay, so in terms of adjusting for density through flight, we, um, when we're simulating this, we use this thing called a pressure far field in our simulation. And we use the, uh, in the solver, we choose the, the air as an ideal gas. So changing the pressure and the temperature is really what affects the density in flight. So we use our open rocket simulations to get um, the, this pressure and temperature. And then the solver will automatically adjust in density. And then what was the second part of your question? Sorry. Uh, I am not exactly sure what the burnout altitude is. Do you remember from open 5,000 feet? Okay, we're good. All right, cool, thank you. And next up will be uh, avionics. All right, uh, hey everyone. My name's Joe Heiser. I'm a fourth year electrical engineering student and I am the avionics lead. So the purpose of the avionics team is to educate our team members to produce a high reliability electronic system to control all the critical functions of the rocket. So recovery, data logging, tracking, telemetry. And we do that using uh, both commercial and custom components. So our team's objectives are to obviously deploy the parachutes at Apogee, the drogue parachutes at Apogee, and the main parachutes at a set altitude. Um, this year we're gonna update the modular board system to use an industry standard design, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, we're gonna track the rocket for recovery using a redundant system, um, which in previous years we've only used one telemetry radio. Uh, complete the design of the custom flight computer and telemetry board. So last year we had a, um, a prototype board that was complete. The hardware was complete, but the software wasn't complete, so we didn't fly it. Uh, so this year we're hopefully gonna have that done. And uh, this year we're also gonna try to collect some flight video, which we haven't done for the last couple of years. So our design process, uh, we wanna build off of the design from past years. So in the past years we've um, made a modular bay design we use a CAN bus, so control area network. That's like a, what's used in cars. It's like a, a typical robust um, network system um, and a wireless arming. So these are all things we've done in previous years and we're gonna expand upon that this year. Uh, so we're gonna redesign our avionics bay for easier integration and higher reliability. So that's kind of, um, I'm gonna talk about with the industry standards, uh, industry standard designs, but we're gonna use wedge locks this year for the boards. Um, and I'll show again on, on the next slides. The previous years, how we kind of mounted the boards um, to have, there was like a plexiglass piece on top and it was kind of not sturdy and would vibrate. Um, the boards were not completely affixed in there. So with wedge locks this year, hopefully um, the bay will be a lot more sturdy. Uh, we're gonna complete the design of the custom flight computer and telemetry system and this allows us to provide a more detailed, higher data rate telemetry than our commercial solutions. So uh, the TeleGPS sends uh, an APRS packet every two seconds. So we get a GPS ping like every two seconds. Um, and we're still gonna use that in a redundance or in a combination with our um, custom flight computer and telemetry system, which should allow us to have like about 50 Hertz data rate live telemetry to the ground. So acceleration, um, barometric pressure, GPS, temperature, things like that. Um, also this year, something new we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna use Ball Aerospace Cosmos for command and control and telemetry. So Cosmos is a software used by, uh, well, Ball Aerospace, obviously, like NASA, Blue Canyon Technologies, lots of um, aerospace companies for the command and control of embedded systems. Uh, and that's what we are, we're an embedded system. So we're gonna use Cosmos this year instead of last year, all our software was made in Python um, and it was it didn't have like data logging on the computer and things like that. So this, this will take a lot of the work out of the software side of things by using Cosmos. 
and again, it's an industry standard, so that's uh, nice because it's been tried and tested um, in the industry. And yeah, just last thing, as I've said multiple times, integrate industry standards. So wedge locks, Cosmos, mil spec connectors uh, for easier integration, things like that. So here's a system overview, uh, kind of a block diagram of um, the avionic system. So in the top left, right here, we have our computer, or we might use a Raspberry Pi or something like a tablet um, with Bluetooth, so that connects to the Bluetooth wirelessly, connects to the Bluetooth arming board, which allows us to arm and disarm the rocket, because uh, we don't want live recovery charges or anything um, active or with the potential to go off when we're near the rocket, so we arm and disarm them. And also connected to that computer is a telemetry receiver, so that's gonna pick up the data from our telemetry systems. And uh, the bottom right, all this area down here with the CAN bus is uh, what's actually in the rocket. So um, we have our Bluetooth arming board. We're gonna have a camera arming circuit. All these green boxes are boards that we're gonna design. Um, so camera arming circuit, and we're gonna have run cam split, which is like a, a camera used for drones. Um, down here, and this is the CAN bus again, so everything's connected over the bus. Uh, there's a custom flight computer and custom telemetry transmitter. And we have redundant uh, commercial flight computers. So we have a computer arming circuit for each uh, commercial flight computer. Uh, and again, completely redundant. So we're gonna use a telemetrum as our primary flight computer and then a stratologer as our secondary. And those also have completely independent wires uh, running up to the recovery charges and cable cutters. And uh, there, there's redundant cable cutters and recovery charges as well. So, uh, and there's redundant batteries for each of these commercial flight computers. So it's a completely redundant system all the way through. Um, so here's kind of the bay design. These are the past year's designs. Um, so this image is actually incorrect. It's a 2U. So as you can see this image on the right, it's a 2U CubeSat design. So like a 10 by 10 by 20 centimeters about. Um, and this plexiglass piece I was referring to, you can kind of see on this left image, it holds the tops of these boards, these modular boards. Uh, so it'd be here as well. And that was our design last year. Um, and the tolerances were kind of loose, so these boards would kind of wiggle and vibrate, which obviously isn't good in the high vibration environment. You could possibly break off connectors or something. Uh, we didn't have any issues with it, but it's something um, that I think we need to improve upon. So. Uh, if you can kind of imagine, the wedge locks will be um, along this side of the board and this side, so that the tops of the boards will be not covered by plexiglass this year. They'll actually go down into slots, slide into slots, um, and then the wedge locks will expand and the boards are fixed in place and there's no room for any sort of vibration or anything. Um, so here's our commercial flight computers, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they detect Apogee and deploy the drug shoot. Uh, at around 15, or sorry, they deploy the drug shoot at Apogee, and at around 1,500 feet, um, they fire the cable cutters for the main shoots. Uh, and again, I already mentioned this, two, two flight computers, completely redundant all the way through, um, and they're reliable and reusable. We've used them the last multiple years, so we're sticking with that for now. Um, so the custom flight computer, this is uh, what we designed last year. Um, yeah, so the, it didn't fly, as I mentioned, because um, there were some software issues with it. It wasn't ready in time to fly. We couldn't get into low power mode, things like that. So we're gonna finish that this year. Um, we're gonna remake the board. There's like a bodge wire here, so a little manufacturing error. Uh, so we're gonna modify that, and make it good, and uh, fly it this year. So I, again, I mentioned earlier, it allows for um, higher data rate collection of like GPS position, pressure, acceleration, um, absolute positions so like gyroscope, we can see the orientation of the rocket, its roll, um, pitch and yaw, uh, temperature, things like that. Um, it will have the ability to deploy recovery charges. We're not gonna fly it in any sort of um, active role as far as recovery goes, uh, probably for at least a couple flights, um, definitely not this year. It's sort of a, like a development piece. Um, obviously in software, we'll be able to log when it thinks it should deploy uh, the drogue shoots and when it should deploy the main shoots, we'll have all that. So we can uh, evaluate how it would perform if it were in an active role. Um, again, higher data rate 
telemetry compared to one GPS uh, point every two seconds. And yeah, we're gonna update the design from last year. So this is the last year's design that's pictured. Um, our commercial telemetry solution is a tele-GPS. So this, uh, this little board goes down in the transition piece, um, which is where we have uh, the ability to pass radio signals. So it has a GPS antenna on it, which is a square, and then there's a, like a whip antenna coming off the end for it to transmit its um, telemetry data to the ground. So that's our main telemetry solution that we used in the past. Um, and this year we're gonna have our custom telemetry solution as well, which will have coaxial cables running antennas down into the uh, transition piece. And that's how we get our radio signals out of the avionics bay down into the transition piece. And this has its own redundant battery um, or its own battery in the um, transition piece. So it's completely independent from the rest of the avionics. So some risks to our project success, uh, structural failure um, in our mitigation. For, so that would be like, like I said, vibrations causing connections to come un, uh, undone or boards to break or connectors to break. So our mitigation is to test the base structure before integration. So that could consist of just vigorously shaking it. Um, I don't think we have a vibe table or anything. So we're just gonna have to do that and um, our new sturdier bay design should mitigate any possibility of, of vibrations causing things to break or become disconnected. Uh, electrical failure. So this uh, could potentially be like a bad board design, but again, pretty much is synonymous with structural failure if something were to come disconnected. Um, and that would be an electrical failure as well. So we use our two completely isolated flight computers um, with batteries. Uh, separate wires, everything all the way through in case one of those were to fail. So we have redundancy there. Um, and another risk is launch delays and power loss. So last year um, we had some issues with low power mode and our batteries being sized largely enough to uh, keep powered on for a long time. Um, so this year we're gonna way over spec our battery, hopefully about 12 hours of on time uh, which is more than you would need um, for getting out on the pad and waiting for launch and things like that. So here's our plan for the year. We're already, um, we've already pretty much done this. We've introduced the, the team um, to our software. We use Altium Designer for board design. Um, and also we're kind of starting to delegate uh, which, which boards and which system, subsystems um, specific people are gonna work on. So October through December, we're gonna design the subsystems and the structural design of the bay and our board designs. And then after Christmas break, we're going to get our parts in. We're gonna hopefully order them over Christmas and then we'll start assembling our bay and our boards and test and modify designs as needed as far as hardware goes. Um, in case there's any manufacturing errors or if we miss something, uh, we'll get a board repented uh, and then work on developing the flight software for all these boards. And then March through April is our final system testing and our test flight. Any questions? Yeah. Are you sampling any other um, sensors like pressure inducers or signal cell way I add out the system or is this all uh, sort of for IMG stuff? So yeah, I mentioned we have, we have like barometric pressure sensors, um, temperature sensors, they're all at the moment actually in our avionics bay. We don't have like a thermal couple running like the nose cone or something. Um, so it's all just within our bay. But yeah, we, we do have um, like an absolute position sensor. So that's like an IMU. Um, so we can have orientation and acceleration. We have um, a high G accelerometer too, so we can measure G forces up to 200 Gs, which is way higher than our rocket will be flying. But uh, on the commercial flight computer telemetrum solution, it only goes up to like four Gs or something. So we actually just like cap out. Um, yeah, so we'll, we should have a, a wider range of data that we can collect. So we haven't actually developed an algorithm yet. Um, because our custom flight computer is uh, flying in a passive role, 
Um, and last year, we, we weren't even using it as a flight computer. It was more telemetry only, so data collection uh, and transmission. Um, we haven't actually developed uh, an algorithm for detecting apogee. And uh, I assume it's just going to be, um, we're, we're going to base it off of pressure, as that's what the commercial flight computers do. Um, instead of GPS, because if you have GPS fix issues, that would be bad, but pressure is pretty, uh, a pretty reliable data source. And um, yeah, I assume once we reach peak, uh, or I guess lowest pressure, uh, which would be peak altitude, and once we start increasing pressure again after some like range and averaging and things to make sure we don't uh, like false trigger, um, then we would detect apogee that way. But we haven't actually thought about it yet. Um, because again, we're just kind of in a prototype stage and we want to get like telemetry and data collection working. Um, and we have our commercial flight computers to actually deploy charges for Apogee. Yep. How would GPS actually Yeah. So we have, we're, we're logging local telemetry with the telemetrum um, and also the strata logger, like they log their, their telemetry. Not like beaming it to the ground live, no. Yeah, last year um, we didn't run an antenna from the. Yeah, it well, it'd be it'd be difficult because uh, we'd have to. The telegps and the telemetrum both run at 433 megahertz. They're on the same band. Um, Yeah, there's like GPS time slotting that we could use. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely look into that. Um, I think that would be good to have even another source. Right. Yeah. All right, yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. And the next, on your flight computer, mm -hmm. that's a really good question. I think that's the best way to ask it. Right? Yeah, it is. Okay. And it's going to have a, um, a remote antenna down in the transition piece as well, patch antenna. Right. Yeah, that's. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think it would be good to consider both data sources, pressure, and GPS um, to integrate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, compare that to pressure. OK. Yeah, thanks. And we've also got another question from the chat. Uh, has the team considered using run cam cameras before? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the. The camera that we were. Uh, it seems that they have had issues uh, in rockets. Um, really? Heat, issue, uh, heat load issues and erratic on off issues and similar issues with data integrity with storage. Okay. Well, then I we may consider a different camera then. Yeah. Great. Yeah, um, so I messaged, or I talked to the Ezra people on Hero X forums um, about using, so it's a 900 megahertz radio. Um, 
they said that it should be fine. They should be able to allocate us two frequencies. Uh, it's not going to be able to communicate with their towers. Um, that's why we have the 433 megahertz telegps and telemetrium. Um, so it'll only be able to be received by our, our own, uh, you know, custom receiving system. What's that? Um, the there's not very many 433 megahertz um, or 70 centimeter band uh, telemetry radios that you can just buy. Um, the to try to make it easier to easier to build and more modular, we're just buying like a, a telemetry modem um, for the ground station and the rocket in 900 megahertz. Um, we tried last year the custom flight computer from last year um, had a 70 centimeter band um, mod radio module on it. Uh, there's like supply issues that never came, so we couldn't actually, we were just gonna do local data recording on that flight computer. Um, and it seems like from my research that the 900 megahertz uh, is better for higher data rate and longer range. We can, we can um, use a higher transmit power of like one watt compared to Right, I mean, it, it's longer range, but the transmit power is like four milliwatts or five milliwatts or something. So the telemetry radio that we're using is spec for 40 kilometers line of sight, which is more than we would need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz, so that would be even lower range, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll look for that. Recovery. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Wolf. I'm a third year aerospace major, uh, and I'm the recovery lead this year. So, the purpose of our sub team is to create a functional, reliable, and reusable uh, recovery system that will safely deliver the rocket back to the ground. Um, and then we also have the second objective of providing hands-on experience uh, and educational opportunities uh, to supplement students outside of the classroom. Um, I think our team really has a unique opportunity to give students uh, experiences of using the knowledge that they learned in the classroom uh, and apply it to uh, practical applications that they wouldn't be able to get uh, anywhere else. Uh, so we have a couple of objectives this year. Uh, first, we want to improve on the reliability over last year's design. Um, last year, we had a successful test launch, and on the exhibition launch, we had a problem with tangling uh, on the main parachute. Uh, so we're looking into uh, fixing that for this year. Um, two ways we are looking to do that are uh, to research design and sew a new main parachute. Um, this is something that we weren't able to do last year. Uh, because of COVID, we had problems getting into the CDME to actually uh, 
work hands-on uh, with building a new parachute, so we're hoping to get and do that this year, uh, as well as optimizing the shot cord setup uh, and overall system layout for our design uh, to hopefully uh, reduce uh, tangling. Um, and then the other main objective we have is to continue documentation um, from last year. So I think documentation is really important, especially for uh, the next year's uh, projects to be able to come back and if they're looking to change it, something we've done, um, they can come back and see why we did what we did and chose the designs we did uh, so they can uh, have a better idea of uh, changes and improvements they can make. Um, so next up, we have the system overview. Um, so our system starts at Apogee when the ejection charges fire and release the nose cone. Um, at that point, the drag chute will come out um, and will take over. Um, and we should be about, the descent rate under drogue should be about 75 to 150 uh, feet per second. Um, and then after we get to about 1,200 to, uh, to 1,500 feet, uh, the cable cutters are going to fire, uh, which releases the uh, pilot chute, which should pull the main parachute out of the parachute bag. Um, and at that point, we should be under the main chute um, and hopefully come back to the ground and leave us at less than a 30 uh, feet per second um, velocity. Uh, and you'll also see on the diagram, the chutes are different colors. Um, and that's also the case on our design. The pilot chute and the drogue chute are the same color, uh, which is different from the main chute, and that is for better visibility uh, in flight. Um, and for our design process, for the main parachute, uh, we start with our MATLAB code that was developed, I believe, two years ago. Um, and last year, we did some optimizing uh, and we want to continue that this year to validate and make sure that we're, our, our code is working properly, uh, as well as educating our new members on the uh, variables of interest in the parachute design, such as deployment height, uh, the radius and height ratio, the gore numbers, and the drag coefficient. Um, and then as far as fabrication goes for our main parachute, uh, we cut the fabric with a hot knife. Uh, we're going to tape all the gores together and use a double needle with a French felt seam uh, to ensure that the gores are fashioned together properly um, and won't come apart during flight. Um, and then moving on to the ejection charge design process. Um, so the pictures here are the ejection charge canisters which hold the ejection charge in flight. Um, there's a bolt that goes through the middle there. Um, that affixes the canisters to the recovery bulkhead. Um, and then you can see on the lip, uh, I don't know if this is gonna work, but uh, right there, there's um, a smooth curve uh, and that's where the wires sit for, that come up from avionics um, that give the signal to blow up the black powder chargers that will be sitting in the recovery uh, or the ejection charge canisters. Um, and then we tape over that uh, lip or the whole opening to keep the pressure in the canister uh, to ensure that the black powder will uh, blow up. Um, and these are printed, uh, or 3D printed using nylon. And then a couple of risks to our project success. Uh, first off, for the, the main chute, um, we could experience tangles or tears uh, in the main chute, which would um, potentially be a problem depending on how big the tangle or the tears are or where and how many tangles uh, occur. Uh, but this would definitely affect the drag uh, and potentially give us higher velocities coming in, which is definitely not something we want. Uh, and to mitigate these uh, risks, we are going to be very careful in the building process. We want to make sure that our parachute isn't going to or doesn't tear in the build process and all of our sews are, are pretty strong. Um, and then as well as when we're packing the parachute, uh, we're very cautious with how we um, fold the chute. We use an S-fold method um, to basically accordion the parachute into the parachute bag uh, and making sure that it comes out smoothly and there's no chance for tangles of the shroud lines. Um, 
And then another possible risk is the cable cutters failing. Um, and this would uh, affect the main parachute. It would um, mean that the main parachute isn't going to come out of the bag, um, which would definitely be a problem because we would be coming in under drogue. And as I said before, our drogue descent rate is ideally around 75 to 150 feet per second, uh, which is definitely too fast to be coming into the ground. Um, and so to mitigate these concerns, we have a redundant system. So we actually use two cable cutters. Um, and this is to ensure that if one fails somehow, it doesn't cleanly separate the um, zip ties. The other one should hopefully come in and, and uh, break the zip ties and release the uh, main parachute. Um, and then another area of concern is with the ejection charges. Uh, so one possible failure with the ejection charges is a loss of power, which would uh, definitely be catastrophic. That would mean that the nose cone uh, wouldn't release from the main body of the rocket, which would mean that the recovery system doesn't start at all, uh, which would mean that we come in under a ballistic descent, and that would be very fast, high, uh, a lot faster than under drogue. Um, and to mitigate these, this concern, uh, we test our uh, continuity of our wires before implementation uh, to ensure that we uh, hopefully will not uh, experience a loss of power during the flight. Uh, and then a second concern that uh, involves the ejection charges would be a lack of force uh, from the, the ejection charges. Um, and so this would, again, mean that the nose cone doesn't detach. And for the same reasons, that would be a catastrophic uh, failure. And to mitigate these concerns, we have a redundant system. So we use two ejection charges. Uh, the first one is 4.5 grams of black powder. Uh, and the second one is 5 grams of black powder. The first one fires at apogee. And the second one fires three seconds later. Uh, so the second one has more black powder. So if the first one doesn't have enough force to break the shear pins that hold the nose cone into the body, uh, the second one will have enough force and blow the nose cone off and start the, eject or the recovery process. Uh, and so our plans for this year, uh, for the rest of this semester, we want to continue to investigate a parachute drop test. Um, so I, some ideas that have been thrown out for this is maybe throwing our parachute out of a plane or a weather balloon. Um, also, another idea was using a, a vertical wind tunnel um, to give us some air. And hopefully, we can see what's going on with the parachute. Um, and then we also want to finalize and prepare for our parachute fabrication and continue research uh, into the ejection charge system. So I know in the past, there's been um, some looking into switching to a CO2 uh, ejection system as opposed to black powder. Um, so we want to continue researching into that. And then going into next semester, uh, we are going to sew and fabricate our, our main parachute. Um, we're also going to uh, start ejection testing uh, for our black powder charges as well as CO2 charges. Uh, and then finally, we want to document our integration process so we can have a smooth integration for our test launches as well as our competition launch. Um, does anyone have any questions? What was that? Yes, Sundays, yeah. Great. Right. Great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. For sure. That being said, how were you under cover from last year? Yes. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So the ejection charge canisters are going to be printed out of nylon. Yeah, so the question was, do we have a spill hole or a hole in the middle of the parachute? Uh, yes, I believe there is one, and I'm not sure how big it is. And we've got a couple questions here from the chat. All right. Uh, are the main chute and port failures really tied back to the fact that you use a cable cutter arrangement? Don't they complicate the structural assembly? And are there other deployment methods? Um, yes. So so the question was, uh, are, is the main parachute failures really related to cable cutter failures? Um, and are there other deployment methods? Um, so yes, there are definitely other uh, deployment methods uh, that we could look into. Um, and I believe last year during the first test launch, one of the uh, cable cutters did not fire. Um, so that could have been a problem. Um, and it, it's potentially not the only problem, uh, but I think there is, there could be a, a problem with the cable cutters, and I think a redundant system is uh, definitely necessary. Um, yeah, so that's a good qu question. Um, so it was about uh, how do we know when to deploy the main parachute? Um, so I think that definitely comes with testing. I believe that's uh, in the code as well. Um, that's something we, we can find out um, and implement with the, with the MATLAB code that we've used um, to design the main chute. Um, but that's also something we're, we're looking into as well. Are there any other questions? All right, then the next up is payload. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Malaska. I'm a second year studying mechanical engineering, and I'm this year's payload lead. Uh, so our project purpose this year is to design and manufacture a payload bay with a 3U CubeSat structure. Uh, using the 3U form factor is really important uh, because doing so actually gets us bonus points at competition, and those points are very critical for placing and doing well. Uh, next, and our most important purpose, is to create two to three scientific experiments to fit within the payload bay um, that will be tested during rocket flight. Um, I think this is a really interesting part of payload, and as I said before, it's the most important purpose of our subteam. Uh, and finally, like the other sub-teams, we also work to educate team members. Uh, we specifically educate team members on payload systems and give them hands-on experience working with others towards a common goal. Um, our objectives for this year is to design and implement a CubeSat experiment to investigate different unique scenarios. Uh, so kind of unlike past years, our focus is actually on biological experiments this year rather than electronic. Um, and we'll test how these experiments are affected by rocket flight to an apogee of 30,000 feet. Um, and through these experiments, we'll obtain valuable research-based data. And also, as I said before, these experiments we inside of a bay, which we will design and fabricate using um, machining processes, and it should be very easy to be integrated. Uh, so for our design process, we'll start out by making a new CubeSat structure that fits within the competition guidelines, uh, but is easily machinable. Um, after talking to the machine shop supervisor here at Ohio State, a really big concern from past years uh, is actually ease of machining and the time that it takes to machine the bay. Um, so we're actually using um, a new design this year where we plan to weld the faceplates to the rails rather than using screws um, and milling out the rails. Um, that should cut down on time and also make it a lot easier for us to machine ourselves. 
Um, we also developed new scientific experiments to fly within the rocket. We use a pretty generic um, scientific um, experiment set up to do this, you could say. We identify the data to collect and how to do so. We create our hypotheses, uh, order our components and fabricate. That's really the bulk of it, of building the experiment. And then we test our hypotheses and record the results. Uh, for the system overview, uh, the payload experiment will consist of the testing of two or more species of microorganisms. I'll get a little bit more into that on the next slide. Um, we also may use electronic devices to collect data. Um, these will be secondary to the biological experiment, but I think that they are also important um, to get more data to see, I guess, how the experiments are affected by different variables in rocket flight. Um, we will likely record variables such as temperature and other things such as that. Uh, the development of another experiment may also be necessary depending on final design and remaining space. We do have three U um, to fill, which is 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Um, but keep in mind that dummy weights will likely take up some of this space because we also have to reach a minimum weight requirement of 8.8 .8 pounds. Uh, as for the biological payload experiment, um, it'll consist of populations of yeast and a second microorganism. Um, the second species will likely be either tardigrades, otherwise known as water bears, uh, which are a very hardy type of a microanimal uh, or a type of recycling microbe. Uh, multiple samples of each species will also be included in the rocket for redundancy. Uh, this will ensure that we're able to gather consistent results um, throughout the different samples. And sterile techniques will be used to ensure viable results. Uh, we want to make sure that the only variables affecting these experiments are the ones changing from the rocket flight and not because of things that we as researchers do. Um, control samples, which will be left on the ground, will also be utilized for comparison. Uh, this is another really important part of the experiment. We want to see how only rocket flight is changing it, um, not the variables from the desert. So we also have these control samples on the ground, uh, likely at the launch site. And then why a biological payload is relevant. Uh, in the future, long-term space missions will likely require the use of uh, microorganisms and things such as food production and waste management. And doing a small-scale experiment like this um, early on is something that is really relevant and also interesting. Uh, so risks to our project success. Uh, structural fa failure of experimental components or the payload bay is one risk. Uh, we can mitigate this by ensuring the components in the bay are secured to it and that the bay itself is structurally sound. Uh, since we are welding the bay, it should be structurally sound uh, based upon that, but we will also test it, uh, similar to how avionics will likely test theirs. Uh, in addition, another risk, because we are doing a biological payload, is sample death. Um, the things that we are testing are living, so we need to ensure that we are able to keep them alive and keep them healthy also. Uh, so we'll mitigate this by ensuring sample redundancy by creating multiple populations. As I said before, if something goes wrong with one population, we will have a second or a third one um, to ensure that our results are viable and consistent. Uh, we will also test these populations prior to competition. Uh, so we will obtain the samples and test them here at Ohio State to find the processes that work best to maintain healthy and living organisms. Uh, finally, our final risk is integration issues at competition. Uh, we will mitigate this by testing integration prior to competition and adjusting it as needed. Uh, so our plan for the year. So far this semester in August to October, we've been working on bay design and project brainstorming. Uh, we're now moving into bay construction and experiment design. Uh, so I've currently ordered the materials for the bay and we're waiting for those to arrive. Uh, the bay will be steel this year actually for ease of welding and also for um, extra weight. Um, and then we will work on experiment design from there and then go on winter break. And when we get back from break, we will continue experiment design and we will begin construction. Uh, then March hits and that is about when our test launch will be. So we will have test launch and following that, we will continue payload testing and we will make all necessary final design changes uh, to be ready for the competition in June. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so honestly, any results that we obtain from the flight are viable. There could be no difference, uh, or the sample could even die. We will measure it against the control sample to see what changes, and that will basically be our results, uh, whether there are differences or whether there are not. Um, it depends on the microbe that we're using, but I would expect to see differences in yeast, but if, excuse me. But if we do test tardigrades as well, they're a pretty hardy species, so I honestly would not expect to see too much of a difference there.
Yes. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. I'll definitely look into that. I like that idea a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, could you say the question again? Um, I don't have any specific names for you right now, but I've been looking into pretty generic yeasts um, like you'd use for baking. And from what I found through like the literature and just reading up on it, uh, most of the yeasts are affected by temperature within a certain range. They grow relatively well at room temperature. I think they prefer, it was, I think, low 80s degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's definitely a variable that would affect them. But I will look more into different strains of yeast as well uh, to determine the exact one that we will be using. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're receiving results from it, that would well, definitely help. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody specifically from the biology department. I have been trying to recruit um, a couple biology students, um, so I'm hoping that they come to future meetings um, because obviously it's very applicable to microbiology, but I think outreach to the department itself would definitely be something to look into. Um, to be completely honest, I have not yet thought about testing uh, G as a or I guess gravity as a variable there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think outreach with the Department of Biology is definitely something I will look further into. Yeah, temperature is, has a large, uh, very large effect on microorganisms, as we've seen.
Um, I would like to use a temperature sensor. I know avionics has one as well, but since um, placement from the motor is different, the temperature will vary. So it is something I would like to track. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will definitely look into temperature controls too. Uh, thank you for the suggestion there too. I really appreciate it. Oh, yes. Uh, so far, I have not really made any design, um, I guess, changes or haven't really made a design focusing on that quite yet. I do think that is something important to look into and something important to create. Um, I do agree with you there, and I will definitely look further into it. It is. I've been working on trying to recruit biology students. And I'm definitely going to amp up my efforts a little bit too, I think. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Uh, so really, population growth is a big one. Um, since they are microorganisms, they do, I guess, grow pretty quickly as a population. Um, or relatively quickly, you could say. So that is really the big one that I want to look at with the differences between population growth, between the sample um, left on the ground, the control, and the one on the rocket. Uh, any remaining questions? Uh, if not, I will pass it on to propulsion. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm, my name is Noah. I'm a third year aerospace engineering student, and I'm the propulsion lead. I guess I'll, I should probably use the mic. <laughs> so the project purpose is to research, design, develop, and test our solid rocket motor, and then obviously give students hands-on experience with our propulsion systems. 
So a structural breakdown of our motor. First, we have our motor case. It's uh, an aluminum tube that houses all of our propulsion elements. Then we have our forward closure, which is the seal at the end of the motor case to keep all the hot gases in. It also serves as the mechanism used to attach our motor case to the actual rocket. Our O-rings and retaining rings are just sealing mechanisms used, again, to keep the hot gases inside the motor case. Now, our, our propulsion proponents, we have our nozzle. It's made from graphite for um, a cheap cost and ease of machining. And our solid propellant grains, this is the solid form of our APCP propellant, and it also serves as the combustion chamber for our motor. Our objectives are, first and foremost, we want to rework our motor composition from last year because during our characterization testing last year, the data that we received showed a very hot burn. Um, and it was just unstable in general. So that was, we boiled that down to the magnesium as the issue because magnesium is very unstable. So we, this year we replaced the magnesium with strontium nitrate and oxamide. Strontium nitrate is gonna be used to bring out the red color for the, uh, the burn of the motor that we want. And the oxamide is a burn rate suppressor. So we're gonna use that to keep the, the burn very stable. Uh, this is of utmost priority, obviously. We wanna really prioritize the reliability of this new composition. We're gonna do that by characterization testing um, in November. And we also want to investigate bringing solid motor development near OSU property. Right now, we have to travel uh, a decent amount, and that limits the amount of participants we can have attending, usually. Um, we also want to pursue possible static testing capabilities at Battelle's West Jefferson facility. Uh, we do have a connection there with an alumni, and we've been, we've been talking about a joint effort with the, the liquid engine team and using their test stand, modifying their test stand to be able to mount solid rocket motors and test them in the blast chambers at Battelle's facility. So our design process, a lot of our knowledge is referenced to literature. The two main books we use are Experimental Composite Propellant by Terry McCreary and Rocket Propulsion Elements by Sutton. The Burn Sim software is the software that we use to obtain all of our characterization data. It gives us characteristics like burn time, total impulse, thrust curve um, from the propellant composition, grain features, and nozzle properties. And then reference historical BSLI data. Obviously, this is very important. That's how we know that we need to change the motor composition this year because of the, the historical data that we have. And then 2018's data will be used to return to a successful formula if necessary. I don't think it will be necessary, but it is there if we need it. Our preliminary motor concept design, this is the data that we obtained in that characterization test from last year. So it's a Mad River Slow Red N3045, total impulse of about 20 newton seconds, max thrust of about 4,000 newtons, burn time of 6.63 seconds, and a max pressure of 584 PSI. So there are a couple risks to our project success. In terms of the technical failure scenarios, we have a Cato, which is the explosion, the explosion of a motor, um, and then failure to, to ignite. That can happen in one of two ways, just general, the, the propellant doesn't ignite, or it's a chuffed ignition, which is where the propellant, the grain might ignite slightly for a little bit, but it doesn't have enough pressure buildup in the uh, combustion chamber because gases escape out of the nozzle before the rest of the propellant could ignite. A casting failure scenario, this would be pretty catastrophic as it could harm the people working on casting the motor, uh, in addition to destroying some of the equipment used, which means we would have to outsource our motor casting somewhere else. Our mitigation plans are to extensively outline and evaluate our safety protocols. That is of utmost importance. Test our formula in static tests and in flight tests and research and train on safe self-casting methods. Our plan for the year, um, for the fall and winter, we want to research motor improvements, establish contact with the ARC. This is a possibility. Um, 
again, we would like to bring our static testing capabilities closer to OSU property. And we're going to perform characterization testing in November. From December to April, we're going to finalize our motor design, certify propulsion members for motor research at least level one. This will allow them to have a, a larger hand in the static testing procedures and the actual launch procedures. Travel to Dayton to aid in test motor casting and complete two full-scale static test firings. And we will always continue dissemination of knowledge and skills and practice safe motor handling procedures. Any questions for me? I'm sorry? Yes, I did. I did fail my L2, though. Yep, you probably remember that. Yep. Yeah, before launch, I plan on being L2, and I plan on having my entire team L1 at least. My L2 is just a matter of replacing the fins with something more durable. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've talked to Gary about it, and he said at least L1 is required to accompany him in his shop and to observe the process and assist in the process. OK. Because that was a fairly recent conversation with him, so I'll make sure I update myself on that one. Okay, thank you. Yep, I have a lot of catching up to do in terms of, of knowledge. Okay. Can you elaborate on on what I Okay. Yep. Mhm. Mm a lot of a lot of information that I think our team is lacking is um related to propellant. I think that's something we've always been kind of dry on and that's going to be a priority for me is um research in that area. Yes. Through the week, um, not unless we are close to like um, a testing day or something, just to get some practice in. But other than that, it'll it'll be almost entirely on Sundays. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's going to be our characterization test. Those are all going to be small scale tests. Uh, yeah, we should be. Yeah, we should be able to get max pressure data from the Burnsum software. Place, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great suggestion. Oh, I know.
Yeah, I would like to. I would like to get that done as soon as possible. The only thing is that it's almost entirely dependent on liquids finishing their test stand and getting that all set up. But in terms of modifying the test stand to fit solid rocket motors, I think it's just a matter of removing and replacing the motor mount. <coughs> Yeah. We could. <clears throat> it's, I believe the intention is to store the test stand at Patel. So having just one test stand there that we could use interchangeably instead of having to drag multiple and switch them out and everything, that would be ideal. But yeah, our, ours is always an option. Any other questions? All right, I'll hand it off to Casey for the last minute questions. All righty, uh, so that completes all of our uh, sub-team sections here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open the floor up to any questions for any of the sub-team leads going back. If you've thought of a question or you, you know, have a new question after reading some more information about the other teams, uh, any questions for any, any team or the project in general? Where you do the uh, the uh, first day where you meet and you, sh you show, right? You want to have a one pager that everyone knows the basic information. Because a lot of times the judges will actually go to someone who they think is like an underclassman or someone who looks like they might not know and ask them some questions. So if you have this one page sheet of data, for example, we've had people ask people, well, do you know what the uh, thrust of the engine is? If someone who's electronic type, you know, they're doubly, they don't know what it is. And then, oh yeah, so that's sort of that's a bit of a down check. So if you have a one page sheet where everyone has a beginning information, you know if you go off that sheet and said, Oh well, I don't know that, I know this part of it, but to get to the details, I'll let's go to the guy who's in charge of that. And that that's the judges like that. The other side is um, there is um, you want to try to be, how do I say this, nice to people, all right? Um, if you can help other teams, that's good particularly foreign teams. Uh, a lot of times the foreign team will get there. Well, we're having teams, there's over 150 teams that are registered for the competition. Probably closer to 155, I think. Uh, some of these people are, are from overseas. Their English skills might not be that good. If you have to speak that language, uh, that would be helpful. Um, and ask them if they need help. If you, you know, tools, equipment, if they, you know, you have something they need, like a pair, I've seen people um, blown parachutes, things like that. And um, that's the kind of stuff people notice. And that there's, a, there's actually a prize for uh, the most, uh, I guess, the most helpful team. It's uh, the Nancy, I believe it's the Nancy Spears Prize. Nancy, I don't know if you guys know who Nancy Spears was. She was a lady uh, at Oregon State. She passed away just uh, two years ago. She was one of the founding members of the Cup. And um, so we, it's, uh, she died of a brain aneurysm and a very lovely woman. Um, it was a sad thing to see her go, but the idea of that prize is that we're going to look for people who are helping other people, all right? So there'll be lots of, there'll be probably over 50 teams from overseas. Some teams are far away from Russia, uh, India, Australia, uh, Africa. We'll have African teams there this year for the first time. So you want to be, um, extend, a, a be, be courteous to them. And if, you know, if they need help, certainly try to help them, okay? People will notice that. And that Absolutely. can help you. Um, you know, you, you guys, uh, the first, I think the second year, you came close to winning the Cup. You were like two or three down. So um, this is, you know, this is one of the bigger schools, so you guys have, have the, uh, some good resources to do that. So. Absolutely. And we That's, did finish second place in our category last year. Yeah, you yeah. did, yeah. But for the big prize. Oh, yeah. Category. Yeah. I can't remember if we finished second or third. I don't recall honestly either. Yeah. I know we've taken a first place, but I don't, I don't remember beyond that. Yeah. Did we really? Oh wow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's so that's that's all I got. So uh, I appreciate the input, Rick. Thank you. We'll be we'll be sure to uh, make sure we're. Uh, up to speed on that. Um, it'll be a little interesting. We're planning to take even more people this year than we have in the past, uh, you know, to accommodate with all the, you know, lack of competitions we have had. 
Uh, so we'll definitely have to make sure we do something. Be sure to discuss that. desert survival too, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Anyone in a polo needs to know what they're doing. I got it. The Swiss team, they were pretty messed Ah, there you go. Other uh, questions or comments? Oh, and by the way, I turned on the ceiling microphone, so the whole room's hot. Just by the way. Uh, but this way, the live stream should be able to hear your questions better. Anyway, sorry, questions, comments? Words of wisdom? Uh, actually, one last thing, playing off what Rick said, and I don't know how they, they used to have, like, chips that they give out. To, yeah, we still give out the, the, okay. the poker chips, yeah. Yeah, it seems dumb, but those are the things that... I think they're going to give out, I don't know if they're going to give them out this year or not. We'll have to, I, have, I haven't heard one way or the other. But it's even just dumb stuff when it comes down, if it's, you know, if the scores are the same or so dang close. Little things that's, that might bump you up a level. I mean, it's just, I think they gave us a few chips because one wouldn't was, was that three years ago? They gave us all those chips because we did a trash pickup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, if you help the volunteer to help, help the, the judging team or the, the operations team, they'll sometimes ask for student help. Jump on that as quick as you can because that, that'll gotcha. get you noticed. Gotcha. Yeah. We'll be sure to do that. Especially because we are going to fly the first day early. Yep, that's the plan. <laughs> we'll be ready to go. We've got two uh, or three days of screwing around. There's only so much screwing around you can do in the New Mexico desert. So exactly. It might be one of those things that if you can get a few volunteers on opposite days just to go out there and help out. Yeah, understood. And this integration process is the culmination, really, of uh, three years of work here. So we plan on being one of the first teams up, hopefully. Sorry, I said hopefully. I'm sorry, Todd. That one's okay, though. That's a hopefully, but. Then when we were out there three days for like 12 hours a day. Oh, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. Nope. Not we'll be up the first day. That sucks. Last call, any other, uh, anything else? All righty. Uh, well, so thank you all for coming. I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation and learned something. Uh, if you do have any other uh, questions or comments, the leads will all still be up here for the time being. Or uh, if you just want to have a chat, uh, not in the you know lecture setting here, feel free to come on up and talk. Otherwise, thank you all for being here, and we hope to see you at our PDR. Uh, I'll send out an email about that, but that'll be uh, probably late January. So thank you. CDR. My bad. CDR. This was the PDR. And if you have a um, RID form uh, with any information you filled out, uh, feel free to bring those up and just set them on the table here. Thank you.